patient may present uh, with an enlarged lymph node, feeling a lump somewhere that they would know was not there before, or not feeling well and going to see uh, maybe their primary care physician. Because lymphoma is not common, the first thing that a clinician is going to think of is maybe not lymphoma, it may be an infection or something else, and so they may try and uh, manage uh, through that process and say, well, if this is an infection, let's maybe let's try some antibiotics, see what happens. If it doesn't get better, uh, then we need to consider other uh, less common diagnoses, of which lymphoma may be one of them. So let's say a patient had an enlarged lymph node, went through a course of antibiotics, wasn't getting better. That's when the decision might be made to do a biopsy and the discussions would then have to be what kind of biopsy would be appropriate. Oftentimes, as we say, a needle biopsy or even fine needle aspirate for a cytology sample might be the first step just to begin to understand what the process might be and then help determine next steps. If it's a needle biopsy, sometimes we can make a diagnosis right off of the needle biopsy. Uh, other times, particularly uh, when architectural clues are important and we don't have a lot of tissue from a needle biopsy, uh, we may need to do an excisional biopsy, uh, so an open procedure which requires general anesthesia, but we have a large piece of tissue, we can get architectural information, we have enough tissue to do ancillary studies such as flow cytometry, immunophenotyping, immunostochemistry, molecular studies, uh, that we can all um, integrate all of that information and come to the appropriate diagnosis. The patient should pr ask the, uh, their, their physician about what type of biopsy they think is appropriate. Currently there's two main types of biopsy, which would be a small needle biopsy or endoscopic biopsy depending on the location, or an excisional biopsy. Features that are used to help make that decision would include where the lesion is, how big is it, how accessible is it to a needle. Like certainly the needle biopsy is going to be less uh, morbid, there's going to be easier to do, quicker recovery time, and so that's oftentimes preferred. But the needle biopsy lacks architecture um, that sometimes is critical into making the right diagnosis. So it's not uncommon where a needle biopsy is done first because we really don't know what we're dealing with at all. Uh, and then if a diagnosis can't be completely made, that then an excisional biopsy is done uh, afterwards. A needle biopsy is generally um, a, a, a small gauge needle. Um, it's oftentimes done under radiographic guidance so that uh, the radiologist know, the interventional radiologist knows exactly where the needle is. Uh, and then multiple passes may be made to get sufficient tissue for routine diagnosis and then any other uh, tissue needed for ancillary studies. Those are, um, usually well tolerated, a very short recovery time, uh, they're usually outpatient procedures. Excisional biopsies are really uh, where uh, an incision is made, a real operation um, would, would be done. Um, so bigger incisions requires oftentimes general anesthesia, therefore certainly um, an all day outpatient procedure if it's done that way or sometimes an inpatient procedure. Immunophenotyping is used um, to help us make a diagnosis of lymphoma. We classify tumors based on cell surface markers or intracellular markers that we can detect using antibodies uh, to these um, markers. Uh, and then we have ways of turning the tissue different colors based on whether the antibody is present or not uh, on the tissue. So we can um, really get a very detailed look uh, at a, a whole uh, variety of uh, specific markers that will help us arrive at the right diagnosis. And we can do this nowadays uh, within one to two days of receiving the biopsy. So the different diagnostic procedures we use, immunophenotyping, is, as we just mentioned, is really critical and is probably done in almost all cases uh, to help us refine a diagnosis. There are also molecular uh, techniques looking at uh, nucleic acids, usually DNA or sometimes RNA, uh, to also uh, help uh, us arrive at the right at diagnosis. These take a little bit longer time to do, maybe two to three or even four days to, to really uh, complete. Uh, and so um, not all cases require the molecular technologies. There are differences between uh, uh, different the techniques for immunophenotyping, immunohistochemistry and flow cytometry are the key ones. Flow cytometry, you uh, need fresh cells. 
uh, and they have to be in a single cell suspension, so that's easy when you're looking at peripheral blood or bone marrow samples, because the cells are already in liquid and uh, free-floating. But when a tissue biopsy, then the laboratory has to disaggregate those cells to get them into a single cell suspension, uh, where we can do flow cytometry. Flow cytometry involves staining these uh, uh, single cells with antibodies that are fluorescent, uh, and then we can put multiple antibodies on the cells at the same time, because we have different colors of immunofluorescence, and so um, we can run them through our uh, flow cytometers and get a very detailed cell-by-cell -cell, um, characterization of the different markers that are on the cell that are important for diagnosis. Immunohistochemistry is done in fixed tissue, uh, and so we have formal and fixed paraffin-embedded tissue, which is a routine way almost all tissues are processed uh, for uh, diagnosis, and then uh, we, we stain those tissue sections uh, with antibodies and then have ways of uh, depositing colored uh, uh, chemicals on them so that we can actually see the cells and know that that antibody was there. There, we can only do sort of one marker at a time. Unlike flow cytometry, we can do 10, 12 uh, markers at a time, but um, immunohistochemistry chemistry is probably the key way in which we make a lot of diagnoses because we often don't have uh, fresh tissue, particularly in tissue biopsies. FISH or stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization. There we're looking at nucleic acids, either RNA or DNA, uh, and then have methods of detecting those specific nucleic acids and telling us whether certain molecular or genetic abnormalities are present in the cell. Both flow cytometry and immunistic chemistry are really looking for proteins. Um, those are the products of the genes uh, that exist, and we uh, um, have a a fairly broad spectrum of different uh, proteins that we want to look for, depending on the kinds of lymphomas that we're uh, talking about. For example, there's the main difference, or the main dividing point for lymphomas is B cell lymphomas versus T cell lymphomas, and we have uh, multiple different kinds of B cell markers, multiple different kinds of T cell markers that help us uh, refine the diagnosis. With regard to um, fish testing, that's again nucle nucleic acids. Um, we can look at RNA. One common test that we do is looking for Epstein-Barr virus, uh, and we do that by looking at the RNAs that are there, because some lymphomas are associated or sometimes even caused by that virus, and so we want to know whether that's in the cell. Some of the other molecular tests that we uh, do um, are uh, amplification-based testing, so people may have heard of PCR or polymerase chain reaction. That's where we amplify uh, segments of DNA to detect them. We can look for clonality, uh, which basically basically means that uh, the tumor is coming from one original cell and has many, many copies of that cell. That's essentially a, di a sort of one definition of a malignancy. And so we have ways of looking for monoclonality of B cell receptor and T cell receptor genes. That's also a very common uh, 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 technique. I mentioned uh, FISH before and an RNA target, but we can also look at DNA targets looking for structural changes in chromosomes. So one uh, abnormality that occurs is sort of shuffling of DNA, so you bring two genes together that normally are not. And so we can see that with the location of those genes with fluorescent probes and look to see whether they're essentially fused or not, and that's another um, sort of technology that is commonly used. The term genomic testing is a broad term for any kind of test that looks at nucleic acids. Traditionally, we've had these technologies that we've talked about, FISH, uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, uh, to do um, a lot of testing that we've just talked about. But I think people are now um, refer using genomic, um, sometimes referring more specifically to actually sequencing uh, DNA targets. And so we have um, emerging technologies and um, to broadly profile the sort of genomic landscape of these tumors. Um, that's still a research tool, but is rapidly becoming in, into use uh, in uh, lymphoid malignancies. Uh, and uh, in the near future, I do believe we'll be looking for not just single targets that we're doing now, but doing large panel testing to sort of get a good idea of the genomic landscape that will inform diagnosis, but also therapy. We have uh, FISH testing and PCR-based testing. The PCR-based testing for um, uh, mostly for T cell receptor and B cell receptor gene arrangement to document monoclonality of a tumor. There are some uh, amplification based technologies for looking at single gene target mutations. There's one gene, for example, MITE88, which has a particular hotspot mutation that's very uh, highly associated with a particular kind of uh, lymphoma, lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, although it's not entirely specific. So many laboratories have assays designed to detect that particular uh, mutation. But we've learned that tumors have 
have many mutations, there are many um, patterns of mutations that are associated with different uh, uh, tumors, and to get at that we have to use these high throughput sequencing, or some people have heard the term next generation sequencing, those kinds of technologies to look at uh, hundreds if not thousands of genes simultaneously to really get a, a, a good idea of, of the mutational profile uh, of a particular tumor and that's kind of the testing that's coming online in the next few years will be probably more commonplace than it is today. The term um, Biomarker testing and genomic testing, I think, um, are related. Biomarker, uh, I think, is a broader term. Biomarkers could be anything, a protein or a nucleic acid. Genomic testing being more specific to nucleic acids, uh, and there, so there can be genomic biomarkers and protein biomarkers. The implications of these uh, uh, biomarker tests uh, are quite uh, broad. They um, help us make a diagnosis in the first place to get to the right lymphoma uh, or tumor type. Then they also can have prognostic uh, Im importance, so whether they are high risk for aggressive disease or lower risk. Uh, they can also uh, help guide therapy. We are now in an era of targeted therapy and some of the biomarkers that we are looking for uh, would uh, let people know that uh, uh, the tumor may be responsive to some of these more targeted therapies. So it really has diagnostic, prognostic, as well as therapeutic implications. I don't think patients necessar necessarily need to request uh, biomarker uh, testing. The clinician that's taking care of them and certainly the pathologist that's arriving at the diagnosis, they know uh, the important biomarkers uh, to do. Um, we uh, try and not over order uh, on uh, tissues and so we, we uh, really try to be efficient and good stewards of the tissue uh, and not spend too much money to work up a, 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 a case. We can find many abnormalities as a result of these uh, uh, biomarker testing. We can find abnormalities in protein uh, expression, so lymphoid malignancies will express abnormal proteins that should, just should not be there. Uh, usually as a result of genetic abnormalities or oftentimes as a result of genetic abnormalities. We can actually then look at the genes themselves and find uh, the abnormalities uh, in uh, RNA or DNA um, sequence or expression. And so we have a broad array of tools at our disposal to look for all of these abnormalities that are important in the diagnosis or prognosis of patients. Tumor DNA, it is a uh, DNA that sort of sheds out into the blood from the tumor, wherever the tumor may be, and then is sampled just by a simple uh, blood test. We have now have uh, ways of uh, looking at that uh, uh, circulating tumor DNA, doing uh, next generation sequencing to understand whether mutations are present uh, that are characteristic uh, of these uh, uh, malignancies. We're really at our infancy of trying to understand how to use those tests. Certainly there's a lot of promise. We know we can detect uh, uh, these mutations. We know we can do it fairly sensitively. So there uh, will be a time, I think, when we will use these for diagnosis and for therapeutic monitoring because now with very sensitive techniques we can detect uh, uh, small amounts of disease that may not be apparent clinically or even through uh, uh, radiographic imaging. The types of genomic testing that we are coming down uh, the road are going to be um, broad scale application of next generation sequencing uh, to both tumors and as we discussed the liquid biopsy which is applying next generation sequencing technology to a, a peripheral blood sample. Those will uh, give us a broad uh, idea of the genetic landscape of these tumors which then would also inform diagnosis, prognosis, therapeutic uh, uh, selection for targeted agents uh, and then you know monitoring for minimal residual disease uh, and even intervening uh, to improve outcomes. Patients have a lot of hope for the future with the application of these technologies because we're now at a time when we will understand to a much greater degree the biology of uh, the individual patients Tumor. Not all tumors are created alike, even though they may say, carry the same diagnostic name. Uh, we know this because of uh, our experience just in the clinical world, uh, and we can now begin to explain those differences based on the genomic profile of these tumors, which are derived either from the tumor itself uh, or from one of these liquid biopsies. As I say, we're still in the beginning phases of trying to understand that, uh, and then we have to develop the therapeutic tools uh, to target these abnormalities and that will also take a little bit of time.